Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fourth debate of term. Um, so today, the motion will be on this House believes globalization is essential to the safety and security of all nations, and we're luckily doing it in partnership with the British Council, um, who we're very happy to be hosting today. Um, so, just a couple of points before we start. Um, in regards to the debate, so obviously the Cambridge Union was founded in 1815 to allow students to listen to, but most importantly, to challenge the speakers who shape our world. So in a union debate, you can do this in two different ways. So firstly, there's points of information. Um, if you'd like to intervene at any point during a speaker's speech, you may stand up and shout point of information or on that point. If the speaker accepts, please wait for the microphone before you start speaking. Um, and it's sort of an opportunity to give a 30 second or so speech or question directed at the speaker. Um, in terms of the other way to intervene, we have floor speeches. So between sets of speeches, I will indicate that I'm opening the debate to the floor. Um, whenever I open the debate to the floor, I'll call for a speech in proposition, a speech in opposition, and a speech in abstention. Please raise your membership card, or if you're not a member, please raise a form of identification to draw my attention. If I pick you, then you can give a one-minute speech at the front, um, advocating a way to vote on the motion. Um, without further ado, in that case, I'd like to move into the substantive of the debate. Um, so our speaker one on side proposition is the Right Honourable Charles Clark. Charles Clark was a Labour Member of Parliament between 1997 and 2010. He served as Secretary of State for Education and Home Secretary under Tony Blair. Charles, you may take the floor. Firstly, um, President, I want to thank you for inviting me to be here this evening. And I want to begin by congratulating the Future Leaders Connect, working between the British Council and the Muller Centre here in Cambridge on their collaboration with you to organise this, this event. I'm delighted this evening to be speaking with Elizabeth and Tom on the side of the proposition of our motion, which is that this House believes globalisation is essential to the safety and security of the nation. I want to begin with a little bit of history. Um, after the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Second World War, the death of millions of people as a result of the terrible things that had happened, the world came together in 1945, and really three different aspects determined the kind of world that we would live in. Firstly, Keynesian economics, deriving actually from this university, and John Maynard Keynes, a great economist, which said economic policies ought to be run to exclude the possibility of mass unemployment of the type which had been so damaging in the 1930s and had led to war. Secondly, welfare and health uh, societies, which were to sh ensure that nobody was totally destitute as a result of the way society was organised. And thirdly, the creation of international institutions, notably the United Nations and a whole set of institutions around them, but also the European Union, NATO, different institutions to say we had to be able to work together across the world to deal with whatever challenges occurred. It was a very creative period creating this approach, and it led, I think, to 70 years, up until very recently, uh, of prosperity, growth, liberty in the world. Just to take you back, when I was your age as a student here, we were campaigning against the dictatorship in Greece of the colonels. We were campaigning against apartheid South Africa and the uh, colonies in Southern Africa. We were campaigning against Franco in Spain, Franco whose grave has just been moved today. We had fascism, totalitarianism, uh, and major dictatorships throughout the world. But over those years, since I was your age, change took place to change that state of affairs and get to a more stable world. The big area where change has not happened, has not succeeded, has been in the Middle East, and that remains one of the biggest outstanding challenges. But even if you take China as an example, when it decided to join the World Trade Organization in 2001, China became part of the world economic system, the globalized economic system. So this was an enormous, a dramatic change. Uh, prosperity was created, dictatorships were overthrown, liberty moved forward in a whole series of different ways. But the side aspect, which became the central aspect of this process of change, was the development of globalization. A global economy in which prosperity happened in many parts of the world, but also a global economy which left many parts of the world behind. So in the northeast of England, for example, 
Uh, the coal, coal was stopped. Shipbuilding was stopped. Steel was stopped. In the Rust Belt of the United States of America, factories were closed down as the downside of globalization happened and competition happened throughout the world. And there were a large number of aspects which were very destabilizing from this globalization process. Whole communities not far from here I could take you to who lost their reason to exist as a result of this globalization process, a very negative aspect in many ways. Challenges like immigration and the way that we dealt with immigration as a society. Challenges like desolated communities that I've mentioned. Challenges like climate change. Uh, we had the 2008 financial crash, a result of an insufficiently regulated economic world marketplace, which led to a situation where millions of people lost their jobs, lost their prosperities and their futures. Those were the downsides, those were the downsides of globalization with which we've had to deal with. On which side are you speaking, sir? I'm speaking as, uh, I'm speaking as I think you'll hear when I come to it, uh, on the argument for dealing with this globalization and not simply uh, standing aside and saying it's terrible. You've got to deal with these situations, and that's my core point. If you need an, an explanation for it, you look at people trafficking, a classic side effect of globalization, uh, the terrible deaths uh, in uh, the container uh, on the south of England uh, this, uh, this week. I was the Minister for Policing when a similar incident took place in the year 2000, uh, in which 50 Chinese people died. A terrible situation. Now, the choice that you have to deal with in these circumstances, seeing this state of affairs, choice one is to hope it all goes away. I suspect that be, may be your position. Stop it all and somehow hope at the end of the day, that these downsides of globalization don't happen. Forget the good sides of globalization, but say, OK, let's just hope globalization disappears. That's option one. Option two is the nationalist response, which Donald Trump, Brexit, Farage, Marine Le Pen in France, a whole series of others say. Their option is to say, we can sort it all out in our country and stop this international globalization threat that we all have. Option three which is the most difficult, but I think the only honest way forward, is to build internationalized solutions to challenge the inequities which are there. So let me just go through those three in more detail, because this is the core of the argument and why I'm speaking and proposing this motion. There are people who say it's all terrible. The Rust Belt is terrible. The decayed communities is terrible. The immigration is terrible and say, well, well, let's just hope something happens, hope something stops it happening, that the globalised world, we can somehow just stop and get off this approach. I simply say that that is not a solution which will actually operate, because the forces behind this globalisation are so powerful, so strong, that to live, in my opinion, an illusion that says that somehow we can escape this is false. The second more serious option is that of the Donald Trumps, is that of the Nigel Farages, is that of the Boris Johnsons, which says somehow we can erect a barrier between our country, this country, and the rest of the world, and stop this process taking place. The most famous and pernicious example of this, of course, was Russia and the Soviet Union until 1989. They ran a completely closed society, a society which said somehow we can be impervious to these economic factors elsewhere. But at the end of the day, even that immensely strong closed society failed to be able to repel the pressures of a world marketplace and a world situation. And by the way, in order to try and do that, they went through tyrannies of the most appalling kind to control their societies in different ways. I think that is not a solution, the socialism in one country solution, any more than it was with the alternative economic strategy which Labour put forward under Tony Benn, any more than it was with Francois Mitterrand's policy as President of France which had to be returned. So I'm now at the final solution, the only solution to deal with these, and I do think you have to choose between these three options, which is to build international solutions, globalised solutions, for trying to control the financial markets, the economic situation, climate change, migration, and so on. It's far more difficult than the simplistic appeal of a Trump, but it's the only long-lasting way to create the security and safety which is in the title of these resolutions, to bring international government into play to ensure all our societies can develop in peace and stability. 
All other solutions do not succeed. Thank you for the chance to propose this motion. Thank you, Charles, for your speech. Uh, we'll be now moving to the first speaker on side opposition, Jan Zygmuntowski. Jan is a graduate of the Warsaw School of Economics, a G20 Global Solutions Fellow, and board chairman at Instrat Foundation, a socially engaged think tank driven by a vision of holistic growth. Good evening, everyone. I would like to, um, be I would like to begin with um, stating that we are against this motion, and I will be speaking against it today with Kadri and Dan on this side. Um, I would like to take us back around 40 years ago. Um, it was a quite a sunny day in the June of 1980, and on Downing Street, those words were said. These were the words that, because there is really no alternative. It was, these were the words of Margaret Thatcher. She was the PM of UK, and they really are the beginning of globalization as we understand it today. Charles, you yourself mentioned Cajun economics, welfare state, and international institutions, but all of them predate what we consider globalization now. They have arisen exactly after the war, but what we have seen in, since 1980 and developing now was the rule of International Monetary Fund, of the World Bank, of the Washington Consensus. It was the unrestrained free trade with no tariffs, even protecting uh, very important pieces of economy. It's about lowering taxes um, and completely get rid of progressive taxes. It's the meager budget, budgets for public services and uh, treating property rights as sanctity in themselves. And obviously in the times of crisis, you yourself mentioned the financial crisis of 2008, it meant austerity cuts, which even worsened the, the situation. Um, I would like to go back to also your words, because the motion, um, the motion to dismantle the motion somehow, uh, I will tackle three things. First, what do we consider safety? Then what do we consider security? And in the end, what does it mean that globalization actually is essential? Because that is what we heard with this kind of rhetorics of there is no alternative. In terms of safety, um, I would go back to your own words. Um, Charles on Brexit uh, Breakdown podcast uh, this January, you said that there is a great world movement of populations against their elites. And after the years of the war, we had shared economic policies, welfare state, and that Later, there was a crisis that many people in many countries were able to mobilize. My question is, what did they mobilize against? Did they mobilize against like, national institutions? Did they mobilize against um, some kind of injustice that was only in selective countries? Mostly, they mobilized against precarious work conditions, but the labor share has been falling universally across the world from around 70% to 50%. And if you look at Piketty's data, we're going back to pre-World War I times. It's the unrestrained financialization of the economy. Um, which is also a very global phenomenon. Um, and we cannot restrain it to only one economy and say, this is only Boris Johnson, he's doing the financialization. Uh, it is the Wall Street that hijacked economies, but not only the Wall Street itself, it's the metaphor metaphorical Wall Street of every country. It's also the displacement. There's over 70 million refugees in the world now. It is, this is data from UN, and this is the most ever since World War II. Um, we've seen corporate dominance in all sectors, surveillance also. Um, how we see the surveillance capitalism now is that financialization uses these tech tools to extract so much value from our society. And is really globalization the solution to it, or is it part of the problem? And I feel that when we talk about this issue and how you presented it, it's kind of like this is the only game in town, you know? Um, that this is the only model we can have of international development ever, which is not true. We've seen international development happening in different circumstances. I think the three factors that you've presented, welfare state, Keynesian uh, economics and institutions, were from a different period of understanding how we create international development. Also, we've seen even the internationalism of like the proletarian struggle, which for Poland has resulted in the creation of our state after the First World War, when the, our like, socialist but 
patriotic army has created our country. We've seen ultra-globalization, and I mean, the World Social Forum has many times spoken for economic justice, environmental and climate and labor law protections, and sided with indigenous cultures a lot of times. Um, Alter globalists said that you have to think globally, but act locally, and that was the principle that moved them. And, and that might be the solution that you actually advocated for. Um, but it's not globalization. So I think that when we talk about this safety and security and how essential it is, I think we have to consider who actually, for whom actually is this security and for whom actually is this safety. And globalization creates a very certain mode of regulating international affairs. We've seen how that plays. We've seen in Europe, for example, that, um, I mean, we're in UK. We're, UK is supposed to leave the EU in seven days, actually, because the popular vote was against some general way of development. Also, Pew Research has, has shown this really interesting data on like which countries, which citizens of which countries believe that democracy is fundamentally broken, and I hope you all support democracy in here, and it's broken in US and in Russia, in Greece, in Bulgaria, in UK, Italy, Spain, France, Hungary, and it was just a poll for US plus Europe. So I believe that as we have left so many people behind that they have completely lost their faith in globalization, we need a completely different mode of development. I fully agree that it has to be the mode of getting people together, but it's not a homogeneous response of globalization, of everyone acting in the same way. There is not one model. When I listen to, you mentioned climate change, when I listen to Greta Thunberg and George Monbiot, they talk a lot about protecting, restoring and funding as a solution to climate change. But the question is, do all countries protect and do all countries fund? Some countries cannot fund. Some countries should be on the side of more restoring and protecting, and some countries should do the funding. This is how we would understand some global equality. Mm. So with no single homogenic solution, we need to look for a completely new mode of global development. I think that mode is slowly appearing. We've seen movements like Extinction Rebellion, we've seen movements and young people from around the world connecting. This is actually um, why we are here today, um, thanks to the British Council as well. Um, I feel like these new issues and difficulties find source not in too little of global cooperation, you're right, there's much more needed, but of a very different kind. And to advocate for more globalization is to advocate fighting fire with fire. Um, in the end, just to, just to um, tackle the, the final issue of, um, of our security, like global security, because I think climate change is still the biggest issue and the one that connects us all really, because it makes us understand we're on one planet, it's one ecosystem. All the data we have from intergovernmental panel on climate change, intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services show that this situation is really dire, really dire. And to advocate for globalization, as I see it, is a, is a way to say the elites had it almost right, we just need a little correction of the system. But that is not the way to go. Some, some, some economists believe there's going to be a great equalizer that will fundamentally shift things, and we might wake up in a new world order, but I hope we can make it ourselves um, by not following globalization, but imagining a very different, real utopia. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for your speech. Um, we will now move into a round of floor speeches. As I said, we'll do a round in proposition, opposition, and abstention. Um, just a note that tonight's floor speech prizes, the first prize is a day course with Cambridge Art Makers, and the runner-up is a session with Regina Ray Photography. Um, I encourage anyone who hasn't given a floor speech in the past to please come up and do it, because really it's not as scary as it looks, don't worry. Um, so, would anyone like to make a speech in proposition of the motion? Yeah. <laughs> I 
I haven't really prepared a speech, so I'm uh, going to attempt to ad-lib, but um, this is more coming from the point of information that I was going to make earlier, that I note there is a particular problem with the argumentation of the opposition this evening, that so far they have failed to consider that globalisation is a process that has been taking place for about the last 6,000 years of human development, rather than the last 50 to 70 years, and we can trace the fact that communities have started to expand their networks around them and inevitably interact more and more um, all the way back from Egyptian societies and their trading networks and through things like the spread of the Black Death along the Silk Road in the 1300s and then post-1800 colonialism, which is inevitably a globalised structure. Um, I'd also take particular issue with the, um, the points they made about um, Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg. While this is very interesting as a new way of social media connecting people, it's also, again, a very narrow view when we should really be looking at the internet and communications as a whole as a new means of bringing people together, rather than just micro-movements on particular issues. Um, it's, the, the speeches as a whole have been very focused on economic development, um, rather than looking at the issues of horizontal development, economic layered over society, how does economics influence the way you live, the way you conduct yourself, the way you see other people around you, more than just how rich you are, who are you trading with. Um, and if the debate moved into this, it would probably address the issues that people feel about globalisation, because ultimately if you are poor, it's not so much that you are aggressive because you have less than someone else, it's the way you feel yourself societally in your position, and to consider the two together is more important than consider just the economics. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Um, as I stressed, I do encourage people who haven't tried before to try out a floor speech because really it's not a very formal thing and we're trying to encourage people to, to speak up and say what they think. Um, so does anyone want to make a speech in opposition of the motion? Um, should we go over there? Okay, I'm also kind of ad-libbing and I can't really read my handwriting, so if I'm like trying to squint at this, then that's why. Um, firstly, I want to say, by opposing globalization, or at least the idea that it's brought um, optimum safety and security to the world, I don't mean that we should be trying to reverse the kind of economic trends in terms of who's producing what that have resulted from globalization. A lot of people who are anti-globalists are very much pro-market and would not support trying to force developed countries back into, you know, providing steel works or coal, man or, yeah, coal production or trying to compete with countries that have lowered the prices of such things and moved into the, the market for these products. And I would support a dynamic economy that evolves and develops, so I definitely don't support neglecting to address economic distribution issues with, by trying to reverse globalization. However, the issue that I have with globalization is that globalist institutions, so institutions like the EU, the UN, often very unaccountable bureaucratic bodies whose organizations people aren't very familiar with, not the most democratic, essentially support a consensus that involves one country, or in practice a lot of Western countries, trying to stand up for the interests of people all over the world and people whose government, people who are unfortunate enough to live in countries who don't, whose governments don't defend their interests in such a way. And this, while it would be nice if it was feasible, simply isn't possible without marginalizing the native the natives of the countries that are involved, of Western countries. And we've seen that with the refugee crisis. People don't want immense cultural change forced upon them in a very short period of time. And often the people who are affected most by this are the people who are the most vulnerable in these Western countries, the working classes. So I simply that this consensus that ultimately involves Western countries having to defend the interests of people all over the world, which the EU and the UN are contributing to by encouraging them to take in refugees and to adopt certain policies that might not be might not be have the support of their native populations i think that's 
an issue for democracy and I think that's what's caused a lot of the disenchantment that we're seeing these days with politics and with elites, unaccountable elites and bureaucratic institutions who are forcing policies on people in certain countries that these people may not really want. So that's my primary issue with globalization and why I urge you to vote against this motion. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak in abstention of the motion? Richard Parkins, Trinity College. Um, I'm not sure I really need to give a speech in abstention because I think Charles Clark did it for me. Um, the problem with this motion basically is that we have people on the proposition side of the house who are saying that globalization is good and people on that side saying that globalization is bad. Well, it depends on who you are. Globalization is good for some people. It's done a great deal for people in developing countries who've had their standard of living increased in a very big way. And if you're not irredeemably selfish, you must believe that that's a good thing. But the effect on the developed countries has been very different. The effect on the developed countries has been a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. Low-skilled workers have lost their jobs and rich people have increased their incomes. And the middle classes have uh, improved things a bit because they can get cheaper products from overseas. So it's not that globalization is good and it's not that globalization is bad. As Charles Clark said, it's probably inevitable. The problem that we should be discussing is how you prevent the transfer of wealth from poor to rich in the developed countries. And this motion really isn't telling us anything about that at all, which is why I think we should abstain. We'll now move to our second speaker on side proposition, Elizabeth Noireze. Elizabeth is a candidate of the Nigerian Bar and membership coordinator at Street Law Advocacy Network, a volunteer-run clinic providing free legal services for those in need. Elizabeth? You may take the floor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to stand before you. Um, I'm very much convinced that the question of globalization actually depends on which context you look at it. But on the overall, we all cannot deny that the effect of globalization has definitely been positive in various countries, regardless of how you look at it. Because when we consider what is essential, essential being the key word, then we consider that it is inevitable, at least what you cannot do without to a certain degree. And also, when you also consider that something is essential, you assess where you are with it and where you would be without it. Now, on the question of whether globalization is essential for our country's safety and security, the answer is a capital yes. Now, should we choose, like Jan, to disagree with the concept of globalization and say it is not necessary, that we should probably look for nationalistic perspectives, then I would probably come up here with soil from Nigeria, maybe a shoots of grass, lay it on the floor, stand on it, and possibly assume that I am speaking in Nigeria, though in the UK. In fact, look around you. Everyone around you gathered from different places and different cultures are all thanks to globalization. So why has globalization worked for us? First, I'm convinced that the only reason why many of us stand here or I stand here before you is because of the effect of the transfer of health resources to different countries, all thanks to globalization. In fact, the World Health Organization in 2015 stated that if vaccination was not transferred to some parts of Africa and other parts of the world, then four in every five persons will probably have died of diseases. And now that includes polio, measles, or tuberculosis. However, if you say globalization is not essential, but many people survive by globalization, then what is more essential than that which keeps us alive? Secondly, is climate security. Jan talked so much about climate security. But we must realize that the problems with climate change are more than the effects of globalization, but industrialization. And regardless of nationalistic tendencies or geographical boundaries which countries recognize, 
The world and greenhouse effects or atmospheric problems do not know any atmospheric boundaries. So regardless of whatever we think, if industrialization takes place in America, for instance, other countries Afri in Africa, in Asia or Europe are bound to be affected. So this is why it is necessary that all countries pull resources together, such as the Paris Agreement of 2016, in order to curb climatic issues together. Because if climate change distorts the situation of things, then we fall as a unit. I'll take that later. <laughs> now on land. It is easy to think that globalization, for instance, allows the transfer of crime or criminal um, tendencies from one country to another. I'll respond to this with three points. First, globalization permits movement, yes, because that is actually the essence of it. But then, the transfer of crimes or the movement of crimes from one boundary to another is more of the tendencies of national governments not to protect their borders. Secondly, assuming but not conceding that crimes easily go from one place to another or people who perpetrate crime move from one place to another, then the issue of globalization is allowing countries have the duty of neighborliness to help other countries in aid of their security operatives. Now, should should we not even accept that, then globalization, through improved technology, communication and intelligence, has also provided the means by which countries and peoples can easily detect crimes and move to stopping them. And also globalization, through the presence of international organizations, has also brought together a more concerted effort in fighting crime through the NATO, ECOWAS, United Nations peacekeeping operatives, and others. Now, next is technology. Look around you, ladies and gentlemen. Almost everything around you is a product of technology. The clothes you're wearing, what I'm speaking through, and everything around us. Now, without globalization, there would be no transfer of technology. And what does transfer of technology even do to our economy? What it does is it increases the rate of productivity of markets, increases market competition, grants people jobs, make people move from one place to another, for job security. That is a plus for globalization, and it helps the world. Now, I expect the opposition to paint gory stories about globalization, or to even reject it in totality, stating that it causes inequality, or stating the problem of cybercrime, which Jan has already stated. However, I'd like to let everyone know that globalization, in fact, solves its own problems. So while globalization, through the means of globalization, there might be threats, it does not rule out globalization in its entirety. For as we already said, life can almost not happen without globalization. And should we reject globalization today, countries, peoples will find a way to move because it is historical, as Charles had already established. I'll take you. Yes, please. Should it be only one? Only one question, right? Uh -huh. Then I'm picking only one. Um, you mentioned that globalization solves its own problems. Yes. Do you believe that, for example, um, climate change that might result in like, the destruction of human civilization is a permanent solution to how we have conducted globalization? When I mean the globalization solves its own problems, I mean that somehow, some way, because of the constant interaction of peoples, the nations can have a concerted effort to tackle issues of national and international security. When this is done, then there will be no problem of civilizations going down the drain due to climatic factors or other forms of change. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's take this analogy. For instance, we live in a world where we are faced with some form of thought of error in medical negligence, for instance. But would we, on the ground of fear, of these errors occurring refuse to be treated when we are ill? I doubt so. So, for instance, Doug Hamaksjord, the United Nations Secretary General, Second Secretary General, stated that globalization was not created to take humanity to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. This means that globalization is definitely not perfect, but globalization provides the means by which we can curb our problems. If the opposition wants to gain this debate today, then they should practically tell us what way aside globalization would really work for our world, would really work for our world in transforming it. And that would not be through radical change, because sometimes when you need to go on radical change, you need the nod of various communities or neighboring communities to support your movement, because the world is already globalized. So globalization is not perfect, but it saves the world from the worst. Thank you.
Thank you, Elizabeth, for your speech. Uh, we'll now move to the second speaker on side opposition, Kajri Babar. Kajri is an Indian filmmaker. Her short films and documentaries have been screened at the Student Academy Awards and Cannes Film Festival and are aimed at initiating debates on some of today's most pressing social issues. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I will be speaking to you about globalization with two uh, perceptions. That would be one as a citizen of a previously colonized nation and one as a woman of a developing nation. What we describe today as Africa, Pakistan, India, or any of the South Asian countries, they did not used to be one identity before colonization. The various communities which make up Africa today were developing in their own ways before colonial, uh, colonial factors intervened. Indeed, what existed then were various types of organizations which were at various stages of development. These included empires, kingdoms, clans, villages, organizations. Such communities have already had their development being hindered socially, economically, and politically by European imperialization. And today, it has again manifested itself in the form of globalization. The idea of globalization in the beginning sounds really interesting because it is a notion which interconnects the world. So we are going to grow as a global village and support each other with the economic development. But what we are leading towards is a corporate-dominated monoculture where nations and cultural groups are deprived of autonomy and identity. Globalization encourages a certain kind of Western individualism. While the phenomena promotes integration of societies, that it has provided millions of people with new opportunities, but it has also brought us loss of local culture, which in turn leads to loss of identity and even conflict. This is especially true for nations which run on culture like India and African nations, where modernity is imposed rapidly and foreign ideas of modernity are, and models are brought into our country without adapting it to our context. It is in fact very ironic that Mahatma Gandhi had started the Swadeshi movement, which was the basis of the Indian freedom movement which meant that we will not have any goods from the British. In fact, weave our own goods. We were, Mahatma Gandhi spoke to the Indians to weave their own clothes and boycott British goods. But today, those weaving looms have been left idle. And thousands and hundreds of weavers are thrown out of work because of cheap Chinese silk and yarn. And our Banasi silk sari, which was traditionally made by our weavers, are now made in China or otherwise globally. Globalization promotes a homogeneous set of values and beliefs. But whose values? India's values? Africa's values? Or any of the Eastern countries' values? Globalization began to help develop nations, but instead it is reinforcing a second-class citizen, uh, citizenship in our minds. And we are insecure about our own identity. The need to be homogenized is actually creating further separations and boundaries, like in my nation, where right-wing politics and nationalization is to rise. We are tearing apart and building more boundaries today than erasing them. A lot of people might believe that globalization has helped women. Because our culture, as perceived, might be really regressive to us, isn't it? <laughs> but globalization has made many international corporations richer by million. However, we are exploited. According to estimates of from World Development Indicators 2019, women work two-thirds of the world's working hours, produce half of the world's food, but earn only 10% of the world's income and own less than 1% of the world's property. So globalization has made male workers in India and other countries to migrate from rural areas to urban areas. And this has put women under triple burden, which includes homemaking, farming, and as well as jobs in the rural sector. 
When women migrate for economic reasons, it has led to exploitation, including sexual as well as human trafficking. Um, just a second, yeah. So, household responsibilities have not decreased for us; in fact, increased. So we go out to work and and come back after long hours, but our household duties begin once we are home. Um, when India went through economic reform in the 90s, so globalization brought into India a lot of new opportunities. But with it, it bought beauty pro- uh, pageants and beauty products. So we were and are still in the colonial hangover of fair skin. The fair skin is considered beautiful, but now we have uh, Western beauty standards as well. And you can see that if you watch Bollywood or any Indian film from the 70s and then from the 90s, we have more Caucasian-looking women acting today. In the end, uh, I would like to ask all of you a question: Who decides what is development, and that development is the way to happiness? Who decides that my country and my culture is barbaric, whereas the ideals from the West is the ideal way of living? Thank you. Take your question, or can I? Um, normally, at the end of the speech, the points of information you don't take them once they've been finished. Oh, we will debate again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Right. So we'll now move into our second round of floor speeches. So again, if anyone wants to make a speech in proposition, opposition, or abstention of the motion, uh, please raise your hand when indicated. Um, so does anyone wish to make a speech in proposition of the motion? Does anyone want to raise a brave hand? It's not actually that brave. It's not hard. Oh, sorry. There we go. Smoothly done. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to just take a moment to reflect about how globalisation has many facets that seem to be being ignored by the opposition, because we've heard that globalisation brings not only economic and medicinal benefits, but it also does bring a cultural dynamic that is being perceived as threatening to others. But when it's said that what is keeping women in the household today. In around the world is globalization. I think that there's a neglect of the fact that it is Western values that are re- eradicating these uh, stereotypes. Because the problem at the moment is a cumulative factor of thousands of years of misogyny being combined with a modern economic working place. Whereas, in fact, the modern economic working place has the c- uh, capacity to liberate people when people are understood for having the same values. Because they can do the same work, they can have the same skills, and so these are the liberal values that globalisation brings. And when they're perceived as a threat, it is only as a threat to the traditional values that are being used to hold people back against globalisation, rather than embracing the liberating capacity of it. Thank you. Um, Would anyone like to make a speech in opposition of the motion? You should go for back there. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here in this chamber with you tonight.、Uh, I would only like to bring to your attention that the notion is that this House believes globalisation is essential. To safety and security of all nations, so you only have to think of one example of a country that's not profiting from, capit-、uh, from globalization. Sorry, especially in the era of capitalism. So please bring to your attention all the working people of the world who are being ca- currently exploited due to capitalism ruling in the era of globalization. 
first thing. And the second notion, I would like to quote a part of a report that says that during the most recent period, and please forgive me as I don't have a pen and a piece of paper with me, therefore the phone, but during the most recent period of rapid growth in global trade and investment, 1960 to 1998, Inequality worsened both internationally and within countries. The UN Development Programme reports that the richest 20% of the world's population consume 86% of the world's resources, while the poorest 80% consume just 14%. So I strongly encourage you to vote oppose the notion. Thank you. Um, would anyone like to speak in abstention of the motion? We should go to there in the middle. Of... I'd mainly like to argue that really globalization, as we're discussing it this evening, perhaps is a concept that doesn't really exist. We economically are talking about a global economy that, as has been pointed out previously, has existed for hundreds of years, if not thousands, and has often not benefited the vast majority of the world. If we're talking about this as a global community, I'd like to bring up a few different facets that would perhaps argue it doesn't quite exist. We talk about cultural exchange as part of globalization, and yet the Asian fetishism we see of some of the major economies of the world really mirrors the Orientalism of the 19th century. The UN acts more as a peacekeeping force. It really is failing because there are, hundred, there are dozens of wars going on around the world right now. If a peacekeeping force that is globalized cannot prevent wars that have lasted for decades in some, in some circumstances, it's not really working. The refugee crisis, especially this country's response to the refugee crisis, demonstrates it. We are only globalized when it benefits ourselves. Roughly, there are currently roughly 125,000 refugees in the UK, making up 0.26% of our population. Compare that to the 1 million Syrian refugees in Jordan, making up one in every three of their population in 2016, and you realize that we are only really talking about globalization when it benefits ourselves, not as a concept that is solid and works for everyone. Chinese neocolonialism Chinese neo is something that we all kind of acknowledge is happening, which can't, couldn't happen in a globalized world because surely we'd be working as a community, and yet the US government is trying to sue the Chinese government over stealing ideas from US companies. There are so many examples of the way that globalization, as this concept we're discussing, does not work with the way the current econ economy of the world works. And therefore, I really think this debate question is rather flawed. Thank you. Great. So now we're going to be moving to the third round of speeches. So. Finishing the case for the proposition, we have Tom Matthew. Tom is a UK Youth Ambassador to the European Youth Forum. Tom, you may take the floor. Good evening. As a college student who has yet to receive a university education, it is a particular honour to be here this evening amongst such a phenomenal company to speak in defence of globalisation, perhaps one of the most powerful forces for good the world has seen. I'm going to make three key points. The first is about what globalization has done. The second is about what the alternatives to globalization have done and could do before finally having a brief look at the future of globalization. Globalization is the story of the international community realizing that whilst we do have differences, our needs are broadly the same. And if we can come together and work towards these needs, perhaps we can promote peace. Perhaps we can deter conflict and improve the safety, the security, and the prosperity of the world. The extent to which globalization is the result of conscious and active efforts on the part of the nation state, or whether it is the result of more abstract economic forces, is a point of contention. But in all probability, it is both the approval of the state and of the more abstract economic forces which have allowed globalization to expand at the rate in which it has. Over certain periods of time, globalization has increased at such a rate that it seems the market forces may have had control, and over other periods of time where changes have been slower, the state may have had more control. But despite this cycle, the truth remains 
that the state has maintained its position as the ultimate arbiter of sovereignty. The state can withdraw from the process of globalization if it so wants to. It would require highly interventionist policies, but it is possible. The reason no state has done this, though, is because it would be culturally, politically, economically, and socially destructive. Uh, in just a minute. Globalization has had such phenomenal effects on the overall well-being of mankind that no nation has had the dogma to deny globalization its ubiquity. The progress we have made is well documented. Over the last century in particular, we have made phenomenal progress, progress which was once incomprehensible. Since 1900, life expectancy has doubled. That is, I find that mind-boggling, and I think it's even more mind-boggling when you look at specific cases. For example, in Yemen, if you were born in Yemen in 1950, you could expect to live to 24. Today, you can expect to live to into the, into the mid-60s. For most of us here, it would mean if we were born in 1950, we'd be having a few years left. Yet today, you can expect to live to near on three times that. I think that's phenomenal. Since 2000, poverty is almost halved. Uh, perhaps later on, I'll go to this gentleman first. Since 2000, poverty has more than halved. And state -based the deaths in state-based conflict have declined if you exclude the situations in Syria. And of course, if we're going to look at the overall average, then it's worth noting that the global community has made progress. Obviously, there are specific situations which are stains on our history, but it's worth considering the overall progress that we have made. Without question, today is one of the best days in history to be alive. And whilst globalization can absolutely not take all the credit, and whilst it is by no means flawless, as the opposition have articulately pointed out, it is absolutely one of the most powerful forces for good the world has seen, and it's this interconnectedness and the interdependence of the international community which has enabled the level of progress we have seen to take place. I'll take a point. Uh, you claim that no state has rejected globalisation. I would give you the example of North Korea. States have rejected globalisation, but you can see that in North Korea, globalisation is still present. You can, someone who is probably um, one of the key people to reject globalisation is someone like Osama bin Laden. But in his videos, you can see him wearing Timex watches from America, clothes that were produced all over the world. He's, this, use, he's filmed using the most expensive equipment, which is built from thousands of parts all over the world. While states may reject it in principle, its effects cannot be rejected. You could say that the period of relative stability that we are seeing is perhaps on its way out. Stable is definitely not the word I would use to describe national or international politics at the moment. So if this period of relative stability is on its way out, then what has been the cause of this? Well, one of the most underlying and fundamental causes has to be the rise in the ideas of the nation, of nationalism, of isolationism and of populism. These ideas which are personified by the likes of Trump and others whose foreign policy amounts to little more than disruption and destabilization. It is these ideas which led to two world wars, two of the biggest stains in our history. Isolationism and protectionism, when taken too far, would break the trade-based economic engine which has delivered peace and prosperity to the world for decades. It is these ideas... Sorry, I need to make some progress. It is these ideas which stoke our tribal nature and encourage polarization, which are without doubt some of the most major impediments to progress. It is these ideas which slaughter our ability to reach the international consensus we need to reach in order to address the issue of the ever-warming climate. It is these ideas and principles which must be rejected, and instead we must accept and embrace the ideas and principles of globalization, cooperation, diplomacy, interdependence, and mutual benefit, because it is these values which have been so fundamental to our progress and are so fundamental to addressing the challenges we face as we move forward. So what about the future of globalization? I'm sure, well, the opposition has pointed out articulately and thoroughly that, uh, that the poor have paid the price for globalization in, in wealthy states in particular. The challenges of globaliz globalization are not new, and nor can they be ignored. But the complete rejection of globalism is re reactionary and counterintuitive. So I, I need to keep going. <coughs> The rejection of globalism is counterintuitive and reactionary. Globalization cannot be solely responsible for the way in which wealth has congregated in the upper echelons. Surely it is the responsibility of the state to redistribute the wealth of a nation in a, in a satisfactory way. Surely it is utopian to criticize globalization on the grounds that it does not do that, at the same time as massively increasing economic growth. A state full of conscious beings, and that is managed by conscious, conscious beings, cannot be expected to have massive economic growth 
and to redistribute that, work, that wealth perfectly all the time. A, and if a state full of conscious beings cannot be expected to do that, then how can an abstract concept like globalization be expected to do that? We need to acknowledge the benefits that globalization brings us, whilst also acknowledging the ways in which it has fed a sense of injustice amongst the working class, who have seen the richest get richer quicker than they have. It is then the responsibility of national government to use national policies to mitigate the negative effects of globalization, which are, on balance, significantly outweighed by the positives. The Peterson Institute for International Economics puts it like this. Globalization is like technological process, progress even. Both disrupt some livelihoods while enlarging the economic pie and opening up new and better paying job opportunities. The internet, for instance, made many jobs obsolete, but it also created new higher paying jobs and industries that were unheard of only a few decades ago. We need to be more sensitive to those who have been disadvantaged by globalization. But to turn your back on globalization is like rejecting a cake just because your friends might get to eat more of it than you. In this situation, it would make sense to accept the cake and then to negotiate how it is distributed. Ladies and gentlemen, globalization is essential, is, is, is essential for our safety and security. The rejection of the values which underpin globalization has more often than not led to greater social and economic disruption. And in some cases, when nationalism and isolationism have been taken to their logical extremes, world war has been the consequence. Now, I don't mean to stoke fear, but we are living in highly volatile and unpredictable times. If we are to be serious about addressing the challenges we face, the challenges of sectarian conflict, the challenges of authoritarian government, the challenges of the rise of automation and artificial intelligence, of ending extreme poverty, and on and on and on. And perhaps the, most, the biggest challenge we face is that of climate change. If we are to do what we must do to stabilize the climate, then we must embrace international cooperation. We must embrace globalization and the values which underpin it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the increased political, social, cultural, and economic interdependence and inter interconnectedness of the international community, which has enabled us to make the progress that we have made, which will enable us to continue to make that progress by providing us with a safe and secure, relatively speaking, global community, and that will give us the best shot possible at addressing the challenges we face. For these reasons, I urge you to support the proposition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. We will now be having our closing speaker for side opposition, Dan McKinnon. So Dan is the ENTS officer for Michaelmas 2019 of the Cambridge Union. Dan has kindly decided to step in due to a last minute speaker dropout. So everyone, please give him a warm round of applause. Hi, everyone. Wait, sorry, how long do I have to speak for? Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Like, sorry, like Rachel said, I uh, just got told about this, so um, sorry if my thoughts are a bit scatterbrained. <laughs> I'd like to first introduce myself. I am, um, I'm mixed race. I'm half Pakistani, half Scottish. So you're thinking, this is a child of globalization. Why on earth would he speak against it? Because I was asked to 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd also say that I am an engineer, so here's a glass of water. Uh, some might say it's half full, or roughly half full. Uh, some might say it's half empty. I think that glass is twice as big as it needs to be. Uh, I'd like to address the m motion. Um, the, the motion is that this house believes that globalization makes the world a safer place. I think um, a lot of the arguments have been about the world makes it, uh, globalization makes the world a better place or a worse place, um, but I'd like to focus just on safety. Just to talk, to, talk about a couple of things the uh, other side have talked about. The first speaker on the opposition talked about the fact that in the 70s we had totalitarianism, as if, it's, as if it's gone, as if it's completely gone from the world. I mean, have you read the news about Hong Kong recently? Um, anyone who's lived in China will be able to tell you that totalitarianism is not gone. 1.4 billion people live under a totalitarian regime. And the third speaker on the opposition said that if you exclude Syria, well, if we're just going to exclude all the bad points about globalization, then of course they win. It's, it's very easy to just say, oh, well, you know, if you just look at our good points, we've done fantastically. I, I did fantastically in my exams last year because I got so many questions right. Forget the fact that I got a lot of questions wrong as well. Um, <laughs> 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 so 
For the sake of my DOS, I'm not going to take that, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> um, also, the point of climate change was brought up. I'm going to give you an example of two cars, the Toyota Prius, which has a one-litre hybrid engine, and a Rolls-Royce Phantom, which has a seven-litre engine. Which of those do you think, from the, uh, uh, the first thing being built to its final lifetime, uh, contributes more to climate change? You think the car with a massive engine, but the Toyota Prius travels around the world seven times before it's sold. That's not, that's not each tiny bit of the car, that's collectively the mass of a Toyota Prius travels seven times around the world because all the parts are made in different places. You might say this is great for the global economy, but it also uh, clocks up a lot of miles. Okay, so globalization uh, inevitably leads to nationalism because if you look at a country like Britain, for instance, you have a lot of people looking at, other, looking at the effects of globalization, and they, what they see as the effects of globalization uh, are twofold. Firstly, uh, they see other people that don't speak their language or look like them coming to live in their country. Secondly, they see jobs moving abroad. To first address the people of other, of other country, um, nationalism is something that I think we can all agree is quite bad. Um, violence towards minorities is bad, and the more globalization happens, the more there's going to be people to be violent against. Um, and like there are instances of this, not just throughout history, but contemporary examples. I mean, throughout history, you look at like a very good example, fascism. Um, that's people saying, oh, these people are other, let's kill them. Um, whereas you look at now, you look at white supremacy in the United States, that's, a, that's had a massive rise because they suddenly, um, white people are seeing that they're not going to be uh, the majority anymore and they're getting annoyed at it. And, yeah, sure. Uh, I understand that the Ku Klux Klan were also prevalent in the 20s and shortly after the First World War, but they had an isolationist attitude to the world. Yes, but the, 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 the fact that it's increased in the past 20 years uh, since, since the 80s or 90s is because it's no longer because the uh, white supremacy has less to do with black people now and it's more to do with uh, Latin American people. You look, at, you look at the hate crimes in the US, they have massively, massively risen against people of Latin American descent and that's just because people are seeing that that's the new group they hate. <laughs> Globalization has meant that there's a new group to, to, to hate and they're going to hate it, and they're going to be violent against it, and they're going to sometimes kill those people. <laughs> Which I think we can all agree is bad. Um, not this time, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry if you wanted to say that killing is good. Um, <laughs> and this is, this, is, this is not just the US. You look at um, Britain, hate crimes against minorities have soared since Brexit. You ask, you ask almost anyone that's not white in this, in this chamber and they will tell you that hate crimes have risen. It's not just a statistic, it's real. And it's not, just, it's not just the West. You look at India, where the Hindu Nationalist Party recently increased their majority. You look at Pakistan, where Imran Khan was recently elected on a massive nationalist policy. Nationalism is rising as globalism rises. And second, the second point about um, globalization leading to nationalism is that... Um, it leads to jobs moving abroad. And this is the point that I've titled White People Getting Salty. Um, <laughs> because suddenly they don't, the jobs are moving abroad. Now, I am the first to admit, I'm an engineer, that mechaniza mechanization is mostly to blame. But globalization is a very easy way to stoke up people who wouldn't automatically be angry. They're saying, you know, here's a person to blame for all your troubles rather than the fact that the economy has moved forwards. Um, how much time do I have? No thanks, sorry. <laughs> um, next, uh, my next point is about exploitation. Globalization has created hundreds of jobs um, throughout the world, which, which you know, for some people is fantastic. Who here has a smartphone? Okay, um, who here has an Apple smartphone, an iPhone? Or another Apple product, anyone got a MacBook? Yeah. Okay, so the Apple factories in China have nets around the side of them so that the workers can't jump off and commit suicide. That's the effect of globalization. You had a product that was made in the US that was brought to be made in other countries, and they treat their workers so badly that they try to kill themselves. Yay, globalization! 
Um, also, globalization means that technology spreads better. And while for some things that's good, for others it's you know, problematic. You look at, um, the speaker on the opposition mentioned Yemen. Um, and let's be honest, the Saudi weapons that are killing the people in Yemen are made in Britain. If it wasn't for globalization, we wouldn't be able to sell them those weapons. Uh, North, North Korean nuclear bombs were almost entirely developed by, by physicists who came from China or the Soviet Union. Chinese tanks that rolled over people in Tiananmen Square were developed from blueprints of the T-34. Globalization leads to better technology to kill people. It's, it's just a fact. And also just le it also leads to um, large potential economic instability. If you look at sort of the Great Depression in the US having a massive ripple effect and the, the uh, so-called Great Recession in the US 10 years ago having, having a, um, that, a similar effect. And um, the first floor speaker mentioned the fact that globalization is not, uh, is not a new topic. So I'll give, you a, I'll give you an example from the 13th century. The emperor of Mali, Mansa Musa, controlled 70% of the world's gold. And so when he went uh, on his hajj to the, uh, through the Middle East, he destroyed the, most of the economy of the Middle East by massively inflating every, the price of everything because suddenly he was giving out all this gold and destroying um, what everything meant. My final point is that globalization leads to more global interference. If you just look at the last 70 years, great powers, or whatever you want to call them, superpowers, have played some part in almost every armed conflict. Um, uh, and if you look further back at the past 300 years, just at British foreign policy, uh, we fought with the Germans against the French, with the French and the Turks against the Russians, with the French, the Russians, the Japanese and the Italians against the Germans and the Turks, and then with the French and the Russians against the Germans, Italians and the Japanese. Without globalization, we wouldn't be able to interfere in all these wars. And uh, so for that, and for all my other points, I would say that globalization uh, makes the world less safe, not necessarily better or worse, merely less safe, and so you should walk through the door to the left, the nose. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for your speech. Um, so we're now going to go over a couple of points before we vote. Uh, so firstly, we have some thanks to make, obviously, always to our speakers for making this debate possible. Um, it's obviously a very pertinent issue right now, so thank you for coming down here to debate such an important motion. Uh, thank you to our AV staff for working so hard to make this event possible, and for our stewards and HOEMs for also facilitating everything that's happened tonight. Um, thank you in particular in t regards to this particular debate with the British Council and the Future Leaders Connect program. Thank you for making this event also possible. Um, in terms of other things that we need to go through, so this week at the Union, the events that are going on for the rest of the week, on Friday we are hosting Ken Costa, Saturday we are hosting Scarlett Curtis in conversation with Amica George, Tuesday we'll be hosting Professor Richard Evans as well as George Dreisariti, who is a Venezuelan political activist, and next Thursday we'll be returning to the chamber for This House Would Codify the Constitution with AC Grayling, Jonathan Sumption, and Helena Mountfield QC. Um, so, in terms of voting, so here in the, chamber, here in the Cambridge Union we vote with our feet, um, so those wishing to vote for the proposition will, vote, will walk through the right side of the chamber, those wishing to vote for the opposition will walk through the left side of the chamber with the door labelled no's, and if you wish to vote in abstention please walk through the big central door. Um, that wraps up our fourth debate of term. Oh, and one last note. Uh, the tickets for our Kaylee on the 2nd of November will be opening at midnight tonight, so if you do want to sign up, you'll be receiving an email, and you can also go to our Facebook page. So, thank you.